Hey everyone, this episode is sponsored by Ledger. For the past decade, Ledger has been the global leader in digital asset security, trusted to secure more than 20% of the world's crypto assets. Celebrating 10 years of innovation, Ledger is making digital ownership more secure and accessible with their latest products, Ledger Stacks and Ledger Flex. These wallets feature the world's first secure touchscreens, simplifying your digital transactions while ensuring uncompromising security through its Ledger Secure Chip and proprietary OS. Plus, with the Ledger Security Key app, you can say goodbye to traditional passwords and step up your digital protection. Your entire crypto experience got a whole lot easier. Ready to protect your assets? Choose the most trusted name in hardware wallets, Ledger, and take control of your digital security today at ledger.com. All right, welcome back. Joining me today is Bob Elliott, CIO of Unlimited Funds. Bob, really great to have you. We're just recording this about uh, half an hour or so once the uh, FOMC press conference ended. And I don't know about you, but that was one of the more entertaining uh, FOMC press conferences I've ever seen. There's some, there's a few hammers dropped there from Pal, so I'm really excited to get into it with you. Yeah, for sure. Thanks so much for having me. Congrats uh, on on taking this over and uh and I think given a new uh, a new flavor uh, of uh, of the pod, and so I'm happy to be here uh, for my first time, and probably couldn't be a uh, a more consequential after a more consequential couple of days than uh, than the last few days. Yeah, yeah. There's no shortage of things to talk about. That's for sure. We're gonna fill this hour up pretty quick here. Well, let's let's start off with um, from the top line from the FOMC. We'll start with FOMC, then we'll get into election and, and impacts from that, et cetera, et cetera. So, obviously, we got the 25 bips cut that was um, entirely expected by the markets. But just want to get your high level view of some of the main takeaways, at least from the initial statement and the rate change decision, and then we can get into some of the specifics on the press conference after. Yeah, I think mostly the the statement and the and the twenty five base point cut was largely in line. I think um, you know I read the statement. There's some tweaks here and there, and you could maybe try and infer like a little bit more hawkishness from the statement than you know the the statement uh, six weeks prior. But the big picture story is that it was basically a confirmation of the Fed continuing down the path that they laid out. Um, and particularly Chairman Powell laid out uh, six weeks ago in terms of a shift in, in policy. And and that was a continuation of what, when he said the direction of travel for rates is clear uh, at uh, Jackson Hole. And, you know, it looks like uh, they're continuing down that path, uh, you know, data or prudence be damned. Yeah, I really see it that way. So, um, you know, it feels like one of the main points of contention right now on this rate cutting path is, whether you believe we are in restrictive territory or not. Um, something he mentioned in the press conference was that he still felt like they were restrictive by the the way at least he perceives it. But I know uh, yourself and, and many others potentially see it in different ways. And I feel like that has a lot of implications on how much into this rate cutting path that they get and also what are the impacts from it. So, you know, it sounds like, as I said, he he really reiterated that he still and FMC still view it as above uh, neutral, i.e. restrictive. Um, do you agree with that or do you disagree with it? And what does that say for the implications of, you know, say a December meeting and, and you know, as far as like early 2025 in terms of the, the overall return to neutral and where that actually is? When you, when you think about a neutral uh, interest rate, um, I think there's there's basically two different ways that you can approach it. You can approach it from a theoretical model based perspective, uh, which is mostly how the Fed approaches this problem uh, when they're thinking about what our star is and uh, or you can look at it from an empir empirical perspective, which is, I think, basically the way that most uh, macro uh, investors look at this. And um, when you look at it from an empirical perspective, here's the basic picture, which is that we've had interest rates at roughly this level or higher for the course of the last two plus years on both the short end and then and the long end. And we've seen real GDP growth be two to three percent during that entire time, and nominal GDP growth be five to six percent, uh, pretty stable. And so, if you look at that and you consider that, like the empirical evidence would suggest that the you know rates around five are are neutral because they are the level of rates that leads to a stable set of economic conditions, uh, you know, for an extended period of time. Um, Chairman Powell doesn't see it that way. I'll, I'll remind you that Chairman Powell said that uh, interest rates above 2% were restrictive, you know, in 2022, uh, you know, when he was 
when he was starting the process of hiking. And so I don't think he has a lot of credibility in terms of determining what the neutral rate is. Uh, and uh, But nonetheless, it's guiding his policy. And his policy is, you know, predominantly based upon the unfounded belief that, you know, interest rates are meaningfully restrictive at current levels. I feel like one of the big debates is looking at like whether you believe to look at interest rates from a nominal or a real perspective. And so like a lot of the idea of restrictiveness is hung up on this idea that, oh, if you look at like real Fed funds rate, it's highly elevated from a cyclical perspective. Do you think that idea is flawed of looking at it in terms of like real Fed funds? Yeah, I think it's a it's it's probably the worst way to think about this um, in, you know, from a Fed's perspective. Now, of course, do real interest rates matter just sort of in a general sense? Of course, like the difference between, you know, 10% interest rates when inflation is 10% and 10% interest rates when inflation is 2%. Those are obviously very different paths, but that's not what we're talking about here. Uh, what we're talking about is the current level of interest rates, um, you know, relative to uh, inflation around 2 to 3%. And I think in a lot of ways, you don't really want to think about interest rates when you're thinking about how stimulative they are or restrictive, you don't really want to think about them relative to CPI because the CPI isn't uh, a great indication of the ability to pay. A much better indication of an ability to pay is to think about interest rates relative to, for instance, income growth or revenue growth or profit growth. And if you think about it in that context, um, you know, the current level of interest rates is, uh, looks much less uh, elevated in the context of, say, income growth, household income growth running at five or six percent on an annualized basis or, you know, revenue growth running at a five or six percent uh, basis, uh, you know, on a five or six percent growth rate basis. Um, and so when you think about it that way, it, you know, the, the idea of being very restrictive, uh, you know, kind of falls away. And frankly, those are those measures are more in line with the empirical evidence of how restrictive those rates have actually been than looking at sort of a real rate perspective. With, with that context, obviously, you know, there's some some hints of what they'll do in December. I just quickly looked at the curve and it was, I don't know, maybe like 75% odds of, of another cut in December. And then obviously there's discussion of how many more rate cuts occur um, 2025 onwards. Um, for me personally, you know, I was, it was, it was insightful to see that there was no dissents this meeting, as opposed to last meeting where, where Bowman dissented. So everybody was on board with the cut, um, at this juncture, but when you compare it to their SEP from September, where, you know, it was, it was pretty divided on whether we would see, you know, today we got the 25s, but then it's like, it wasn't certain whether they expected to see another 25 by year end within that context. And just like where the forward curve is at, do you see value there? Or do you feel like it's fairly priced? Do you feel like they'll get less cuts than is what's currently priced into the forward curve? What are you seeing there? Yeah, I mean, right now, um, we're seeing, you know, roughly another 75 ish basis points for the next six months for the remainder of the six months, 100 basis points, including uh, of total cuts, including today, um, and 150 basis points since September, you know, it seems about right. Like it seems about right in the sense of seems like a plausible, even money view on what the Fed is likely to do over the course of the next uh, six months. Um, I don't see a lot of, you know, screaming value on on one side or the other. Um, when I when I look at that trade, you know, certainly if I compare it to other times, like when there were seven cuts priced in for 2024 uh, to begin the year or things like that, you know, this is this is much more. Aligned, and I think basically Chairman Powell confirmed, you know, roughly no matter what, uh, the cuts are coming, and you know they're not going to be aggressive, but they're also not going to be, uh, you know, holding rates uh, at current levels for an extended period of time. And so, you know, you basically get roughly a cut, you know, somewhere between every, you know, roughly every other meeting, maybe a little faster than that. That seems about what I'd expect given the reaction function that they're outlining. Now, whether that is prudent policy, that's a whole different story. Mm -hmm. An important story from a person who's trading asset markets, right? Yeah. You know, cutting into an economy that still has unemployment, you know, basically just off multi-decade lows, um, you know, growth is still running at two to 3%, inflation is above their mandate. Like all of those things would suggest hesitance to cut further, but the cuts are coming. 
I mean, this is a good segue into some of the the key points that I saw in the in the press conference. Where, um, to your point, they're cutting into what feels like a pretty pretty darn good economy. But you know, when you hear what he's talking about, uh, you know, in his dual mandate, first off on inflation, you know, he mentioned that uh, he was looking at mostly like three month and six month annualized core PCE, and he mentioned that at like two point three percent, and he's like, well, you know, we see that consuming it to two percent, so I don't know, we're not we're not worried about that. And then he mentioned. Uh, pretty off the cuff that he felt like the current labor market is is somewhat cooler than it was in 2019 which was interesting to me so with that you know framing in mind just want to hear like what are some of the main takeaways you had from that press conference and what does that entail into how they're thinking about the economy versus what you're saying which is that it's it seems like and i agree with it is that we're at a pretty good spot you know in terms of economic strength the press conference basically confirmed uh you know my suspicion that um that Chairman Powell endorses um, a continuation of cuts, um, despite the fact that he even recognizes that the economy is in pretty good shape. And the reason why that is, is because he believes that inflation is beat. And one of the most sort of torturous parts of that whole conversation was having to listen to him rationalize why inflation is absolutely, no matter what, definitely 2%. And don't you ask any more questions about it because I will I will torture every piece of information that is available to confirm to, to confirm my bias that inflation is basically two percent and I won't take any other information in that would raise a question about it. And so I think for me, what that does is it raises the question, like literally, like what information would Chairman Powell have to have in order for him to change his mind that uh, that interest rates are uh, very restrictive at these levels, and that inflation is beat. Um, and you know, I my my sense is uh, like nothing would change his mind. And so, I, and in particular, it was interesting. He even acknowledged at the beginning of the of the presser in the the first couple of questions, like, "Yep, growth is strong and stronger than we expected, and inflation is elevated and higher than we expected," but. Cuts are coming anyway, <laughs> basically yeah. in line with the SCP that we outlined in September. And that's, you know, that's the that's that right there is the perfect instantiation of what over easy monetary policy really is all about, which is, you know, regardless of the data, regardless of the risks to inflation, et cetera, you keep cutting. And uh, and that's the path we're on. And that implication of, yeah, what you've been calling this over easy monetary policy is really interesting because, you know, there's a few questions that were posed at him about what's been going on in the long bond there and the, the surging yields. So, you know, obviously, like if you just look at the the price action since the first cut, um, you know, what the long bond yield has been doing in the last month is like it, it's absolutely absurd in terms of the increase. And obviously that's notable. He tried to, you know, basically swat that away. Any sort of like concern about that, you know, obviously he was saying that he was trying to decompose what were the actual uh, price drivers of that move because, you know, there's a few things happening at the same time there. But what was your reaction to, you know, just him not really caring about what's going on with the long bond there and just in the long bond in general, like what has been the key driver for it for you? Has it been that 50 bips cut? Has it been, you know, the economy just being better than expected? Is it a Trump thing? What are you seeing there? Well, I think on, in terms of the rise in bond yields, just, you know, the day after the the Fed made their uh, policy announcement um, in September, basically said, you know, this this is over easy monetary policy, right? You're easing into a relatively strong economy. And the Fed is comfortable with easing into a relatively strong economy. And, you know, that sort of choice is it's it's a bit unusual. Typically, central banks don't behave that way. Typically, they only agree uh, ease aggressively in an environment of falling growth. Um, but, you know, easing into a, a reasonably strong economy is something that does come up. You know, you see it in a lot of times in emerging economies. Um, and the sort of dynamics that you typically see during that are pretty clear, which is that stocks and gold outperform in that country's currency and that, you know, bonds are... Um, are eschewed by uh, many investors and, you know, you typically see yields rise and a curve steepening and like, you know, pretty much that's what we got. <laughs> um, yeah. No, I think that was, uh, I, I describe it as that was sort of enhanced by the fact that we had some positive growth surprises on top of the implementation of the monetary policy and, you know, a little bit probably uh, from the election dynamics, you know, though that's, uh, yeah, it's probably like, modest relative to the other factors at play. Um, and so, you know, I think 
from the Fed's perspective, the long rate rising is not, it's not, it has not risen sufficiently to raise concerns for them. Uh, I think it was pretty clear about that because, you know, I, and I think that that's, that, that part of it's actually a pretty reasonable take. Cause like, look, growth stronger than expected in the current level of yields is about, you know, is 4.4, which is basically where we've been for the last couple of years in terms of the level of the 10 year bond. You know, we've been in this range between 375 and five, you know, 4.4 doesn't look particularly extreme. What that highlights is that bond yields could rise, you know, pretty meaningfully beyond where they are right now before the Fed would start to get meaningfully concerned about the level of yields, you know, having a negative effect on the economy. The situation is an interesting one because, you know, I don't know about you, but I was quite surprised to see like zero questions about quantitative tightening in that path there. It feels like that was sort of a layup to ask at that situation because, you know, the uh, the smart folks that really, you know, dig deep on, on Fed plumbing were felt like, you know, roughly like Q1 of 2025 is when we might see that end. Um, so it felt like, you know, especially with the context of uh, surging long bond yields, they might signal something about that ending, but there were zero questions about it and zero comment from himself as well. Um, did that surprise you? Because I don't know, it just feels like, do you think it's like just being complacent about what's going on with the long bond yields? Or what do you think like is going on there? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, uh, I dream of the day when, uh, you know, the Finn Twitters get a seat uh, in the room. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then we can yeah. have like a rotating a rotation of which one of us gets to ask a question. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think that's going to happen anytime, anytime soon. But uh, but yeah, I was surprised. You know, there's basically no conversation about the balance sheet. I think in part because from the Fed's perspective, um, you know, Chairman Powell basically and the and sort of the Fed orthodoxy is that um, that balance sheet roll off has no has no impact on monetary conditions. And when I say no impact, I mean like literally there are papers written by the Fed that suggest that quantitative tightening has no impact on the economy. And that is crazy. Um, and the reason why that is, is because you know the selling of bonds or the reduction in the holding of duration by the Federal Reserve is, you know, is an asset sale. Uh, and that and any asset sale has a, you know, should have uh, an expected impact on uh, on you know asset prices in general, and so I think basically the Fed has every intention to just sort of quietly, you know, reduce the balance sheet, let QT run for a little bit, and uh, you know, in the next couple of meetings, probably they'll say that they've gotten the level of uh, of reserves and balance sheet size back to roughly where they want it to be, and then they'll stop. The thing that's interesting about that is it will likely compound the easing. Mm -hmm. dynamic already at play because you know if you stop selling assets or effectively selling assets or they're rolling it off but the the point is the same which is if um if the fed you know is holding less duration uh you know stops slowing the amount of duration or stops uh reducing the amount of duration that they're holding that is on the margin stimulative and so you know it'll probably be an additional point of stimulation not huge but you know just tack it on in as another indication of this over easy monetary policy. It's, it's, it's really interesting. It feels like there's a lot of counterintuitive things going on. And I just think about the context of like a great uh, report that our mutual friend Andy Constant put out about just like breaking down what, you know, we've been talking about what is likely to occur that the Fed is going to do, but I want to shift a little bit to like what we think they actually should do um, somewhat and just talk a bit about that is that, you know, he wrote out that this thesis that, you know, to, to get control of the long bond, they need to to come in more hawkish, and, and that would allow that to settle down. Now, obviously, we talk about what they're doing on, on the Fed funds rate in terms of lowering interest rates. But when you look at the context of what's been going on in the long bond, which is where most of the borrowing and lending of the economy occurs, there's actually been a somewhat of a, a tightening of financial conditions there. So perhaps we get into this world where I don't know, the Fed is more hawkish, but that actually eases in a way. Um, and these weird di dynamics like that. I'm just curious, like, how do you think about all of, all of that and Andy's piece in the context of what should, what do you think would be the right thing to do here? Well, I think prudent uh, monetary policy in this sort of circumstance, to be blunt, would be to do nothing. Um, mm -hmm. And if you look back through time, if I just, if I just plopped you in a normal economy and I said, look, Growth has been roughly at potential for a couple of years. Inflation was very high and is still a bit above what the mandate is. And, you know, unemployment rate is low and uh, interest rates have basically been at this level for a couple of years. What would you do? My answer would be 
you know, uh, neutral, maybe even tighten a tad because, uh, you know, inflation's above target. Um, and yet, you know, the the Fed has chosen an, a, uh, a, an unusual but not, you know, not uh, unheard of path uh, with the over easy path. So um, in some ways, it doesn't really matter that much as a as an investor, because you, you trade the markets and the policies that are in front of you, not the markets and policies that should be pursued. Um, uh, and, and obviously that influences what you think probabilistically, what should be done or what is the orthodox approach often influences you in terms of what you guess the policies policy response will be. But I just emphasize on, on in mid-September last month, the Fed rewrote the reaction function the reaction function is despite a strong economy, cuts are coming ahead and that there is no inflation and that that's the reaction function that they have and are holding. And until I see indications that they choose to change their reaction function, I'll assume that, you know, that they'll continue to pursue it that way. And today was further confirmation of that view. Would you take that reaction function as far as saying that they've basically given up on like a 2% target? I would not say that. Um, and the reason why I wouldn't say that is uh, I think if you, you know, could crawl into the recesses of Chairman Powell's mind, I I believe that he believes that inflation is beat. Um, and his soliloquy today about uh, all the reasons why inflation is actually 2%, despite uh, printing at 2.7% on a year over year basis, I think is like an indication, like a like a sight into his id of his, you know, of how he's thinking about inflation here. Um, and so the question is what will shake him of that uh, belief uh, when you see things like this, you know, a lot of confidence, let's say in a particular view, it typically takes a lot of information to the contrary. Um, you know, we saw that during transitory. I mean, how much data did, Chairman Powell need before he finally gave up on the idea that this stuff was transitory. We're basically seeing the same, uh, you know, mental uh, approach uh, happening again. Hey everyone, this episode is sponsored by Ledger. For the past decade, Ledger has been the global leader in digital asset security, trusted to secure more than 20% of the world's crypto assets. Celebrating 10 years of innovation, Ledger is making digital ownership more secure and accessible with their latest products, Ledger Stacks and Ledger Flex. These wallets feature the world's first secure touchscreens, simplifying your digital transactions while ensuring uncompromising security through its Ledger Secure Chip and proprietary OS. Plus, with the Ledger Security Key app, you can say goodbye to traditional passwords and step up your digital protection. Your entire crypto experience got a whole lot easier. Ready to protect your assets? Choose the most trusted name in hardware wallets, Ledger, and take control of your digital security today at ledger.com. All right, back to the show. I want to just quickly touch on the labor market side of things because that feels like something that he's really hanging his hat and, you know, basically the Fed put is, is seems to be struck underneath the labor market and he's really owning that. So, you know, you've been, I, I've seen you post this like weekly thing of, you know, the, the labor market is not, is secularly tight. And then he eventually um, a couple months ago shifted to, uh, it's, it's no longer tight, but you know, it's not obscenely uh, cooler anymore like that. So I'm just curious to get like your high level perspective on the labor market and whether this, um, this, you know, just aggressive Fed put that's struck underneath the labor market is, is it like warranted at all? What are they missing that you feel like is, is not warranted for that? Well, I mean, first of all, from a level perspective, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when 4% inflation, 4% unemployment rate was considered a very strong labor market or where, <laughs> Um, you know, uh, prime age uh, employment being at 25 year highs means that you know, the labor market's pretty strong. Um, and so, you know, I look at those numbers and I say, yeah, you've, we've gone from where we were in 2022 and early 2023, where the labor market was like incredibly hot, like red hot to a labor market that is, you know, strong. And to be clear, Chairman Powell in the meeting said the labor market is strong probably a half dozen times. So it's not like there's a disagreement about the fact that the labor market is strong. Um, what he's saying is that he wants to maintain a very strong labor market, I think in part because he doesn't see any risk of, on the inflationary side of things or de minimis risk on the inflationary side of things, even despite cuts. And so 
I think that general consensus, like from a level of the labor market, I think mostly, you know, most people are, are, are aligned. Most reasonable people are aligned with that view. I think the thing that is a real interesting question is, is the labor, is a strong labor market supportive to inflationary pressures? And I think there, there's a meaningful disagreement where what Chairman Powell's um, uh, thinking is to look at level indicators as they compare to level indicators in 2019, and and which was a time when you know the labor market was strong, but wage growth and inflation was you know at target, and say, hey, look, we're at the same sort of level as we saw at that point in time, or close to it, depending on your measure. Therefore, there was no inflation pressure back then from labor markets, so there must not be inflation pressure today from it. And the problem with that thinking is it misses the fact that prices have gone up 30% in the last four years. And so labor market conditions at the same level of tightness today have a totally different perspective in terms of what is appropriate nominal wage growth to maintain you know, real purchasing power, totally different perspective than it was in 2019. Now, why he, see, why he doesn't see the difference between you know, wages today and, and, and pressure on wage growth before, I don't know, but there's a, you know, today nominal wage growth growth is 5%. That is very high unless you have extremely high productivity growth um, and most likely creates, you know, pressures, structural inflationary pressures that will, you know, keep inflation above the the Fed's mandate. Okay. So the last, you know, major bucket of, of themes that I saw from the press conference was obviously we're recording this within the context of a major U.S. election that just occurred. Um, Trump won, highly likely uh, it's going to be a red sweep in Congress. And so there is naturally a few questions asking basically about uh, what, what would be some hypotheticals of, say, if Trump asked uh, Powell to basically resign before his term ends and also asking, you know, what would happen if Trump tried to basically demote uh, different Fed governors or vice chairs, et cetera. And he was the most resolute I've pretty much ever seen him in just batting that down. What were your thoughts about that? And what are the implications? Because, you know, as I saw, as that as was occurring, I started to see that, like, you know, long bonds started to, to rally a little bit. It felt like, you know, the markets were, were feeling a bit good about uh, this, this just being resolute about Fed independence. What did you think? Well, I think, uh, you know, Chairman Powell comes from uh, sort of a long line of, Fed uh, orthodox views of the Fed, and that is that it's an independent agency um, that is, you know, non-political. And he's made a heck of an effort during a highly politicized environment to, by and large, make no comment on political matters at all. And you know, his statements today, particularly in terms of like pencil uh, being reticent, I should say, to pencil out prospective policy implications of a new administration all align with this idea of, you know, affirming the Fed as a non-political entity. You know, I think the the emphasis that the Fed is independent and that once um, once someone is confirmed, uh, they're in the seat regardless of the desires of the executive is totally aligned with that uh, perspective. Now, what I'd say is, um, uh, you know, it, it's the reality is probably more ambiguous than what Chairman Powell said in that press conference. And so, uh, you know, it's important to recognize that, you know, just because he says that the executive can't um, do certain things doesn't necessarily mean that that's either true or false. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair. I'm curious about what you think in terms of the the dichotomy moving forward between the impact of monetary policy in the face of basically a non-gridlocked Congress and a, and a highly, um, you know, impactful in policy, like new policies uh, from Trump. So, you know, it feels like the the big de- debate is, you know, like, what can the Fed really do in the face of that? You know, so if, if Trump comes out and, and, you know, with a fully, fully read Congress and decides to implement tariffs, et cetera, um, tax cuts, like, how much power or like strength or stronghold does the Fed even have on impacting the economy in the face of just, you know, maybe, maybe believe that's fiscal dominance, maybe not, but just curious your thoughts. Well, I thought one of the more interesting uh, conversations um, is uh, at the beginning of the press conference was uh, Chairman Powell basically outlining and making very, very clear that prospective policies from a new administration 
has zero impact on the Fed's actions until those policies are approved and implemented and have influence on macroeconomic outcomes, right? So just think about that. What that means is that, uh, and, and there's a lot of people, a lot of people in the pundit class here and the macro pundit class who will say, because Trump's coming in, it will have an influence on the Fed. I just want to emphasize, it will have zero influence on the Fed until the policies are actually implemented and have a macroeconomic effect. What that means, and I think it's very important, is we're in a time frame where most likely the Trump administration will pursue a number of pro-growth policies, essentially running more expansionary fiscal policy directly and indirectly into an already hot economy. But the Fed will not respond to that until they see it, which means the Fed is going to keep up their cutting cycle, even though... There's a bunch of, you know, canisters of gasoline sitting around by the fiscal authorities ready to dump it on this economy, and the Fed is operating blind in response to that. And so I think that creates one of the more interesting dynamics that we're likely to see, which is if you look over the next six months, we're going to get a bunch of monetary easing. And then over the subsequent six to 12 months, we're going to get a bunch of fiscal easing. And then only then are we likely to see all of that show up into the data, higher inflation, all of those things. And only then will the Fed respond. And so we could easily have basically a huge impulse of yeah. easing from a fiscal and monetary perspective during this time frame before anyone catches themselves. And only adding to that is Powell's delusion that inflation is absolutely beaten 2% and will never go higher than that uh, out into the future. Yeah. Yeah. That is a, that is a doozy. So, okay. Um, you know, we can, we can, we, there's no point really debating the semantics of how powerful that fiscal impulse will be, but I don't know if we just say on a scale of, of one to 10, you know, if, if you take Trump's views at face value, when we call that like a nine out of 10 on the fiscal impulse scale. So if we just dial it back to say like the impact of like, I don't know, four or five out of 10 or something like that, if that occurs, do you think that the, like the fed and monetary policy has the, the correct tools to tame inflation within that context of like continued fiscal impulse, or do they get to a point where it gets really hard to even like wrangle that? Uh, I mean, I think the, the, the Fed has every tool imaginable. I mean, has all the tools that they need to constrain um, inflationary pressures. Uh, if, you know, fiscal, uh, if fiscal policy is too expansionary, the question is, do they have the fortitude Right. Uh, to do it like that's 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 the only question. Um, I mean, as a simple example, you know, the economy can if the economy is running hot, it's very easy to slow the economy, just raise interest rates to 10 percent. And if that's not enough, raise them to 20 percent. You know, like this is not <laughs> an impossible task or, you know, cut the balance sheet in half uh, in yeah. a year. Right. These are these are not impossible things to accomplish. The question is. Um, does the is the Fed committed to executing on that and using those tools if they need to in response to elevated inflation? What I'd say is the indications, at least the the Powell Fed, the indications are that there is a willingness to take steps, make an effort to combat inflation. I think we can, uh, you know, we might disagree on how aggressive they need to be and whether they're prematurely easing, but. You know, we certainly have seen an F, you know, seen a willingness to uh, to tighten in response to those pressures if they were to emerge again. Yeah, I, I guess I just feel like the the measures are almost like half measured. You know, like I think about I think about quantitative tightening and the approach that they took there about just like letting it be passive roll off versus active selling. It feels like at every juncture they they never really have the true willingness to do what it takes. They they try to talk like they do, but it feels like in practice it's sort of opposite. Yeah, but that I think comes to the fact of probably two things. One, um, overstating what the the impactfulness and restrictiveness of mon of interest rates are, and so I think you know they didn't. Um, there's a disagreement, I'd say, between you know certain people who have one view of the world in terms of the impactfulness of of interest rates at five and a half versus you know what the Fed viewed it as much more restrictive. Um, I think combined with the fact that to some extent the Fed got lucky in the sense of they got unlucky that the supply chain issues caused a lot of the inflation. And then they got lucky that the resolution of those supply chains created a lot of disinflation. And so um, plus oil prices falling. And so mm. um, 
you know, they were never they were never challenged on the quantitative tightening front. They were never forced to make the additional tightening choice from their original moves um, through this through this period because inflation started to come down. You know, I, my guess is if they were faced with that choice, um, they would you know use more balance sheet, more aggressive balance sheet uh, consolidation in order to um, tighten policy. But you know, we haven't it hasn't been tested. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. I guess one of the big things people worried about right now is fiscal deficits. And, you know, they look at the the two potential electoral outcomes of, you know, Kamala versus Trump, and, and they both would likely increase the deficit Trump possibly more. Um, we got the possibly more outcome. And so now there's continued discussion of what is the impact of that on potential deficits. So, you know, just the first question on that regard is a simple one, which is, do, are you concerned about fiscal deficits? Well, I don't know what you mean by concerned. I mean, uh, will deficits be larger? Yes, deficits will be larger. Will that lead to greater um, financing needs from the government? For sure. It'll also lead to stronger growth. That on the surface should combine to put an upward pressure on long-term interest rates. Now, I think the question is, how big a pressure will that be on long-term interest rates? And in particular, will that pressure be large enough to create a monetary tightening that offsets the fiscal, the positive fiscal impulse, as well as the the monetary easing that we're seeing on the front end. And there, you know, my guess is that the beta to those increased deficits and issuance is probably going to be lower than many sort of uh, many uh, folks who uh, doom about, you know, the long term U.S. bond market. Yeah. Uh, yeah. will suggest. And the reason why that is a, a couple fold. One, just remember the US economy is the strongest economy in the world, in the developed world, and has the highest interest rates on the long end, and actually is getting a lot of demand from elsewhere in the developed world for higher yielding US debt. And if US debts rise, that will likely incentivize more demand, not less demand. That's number one. Number two is, if we get into a situation where yields are rising to the point where they start dragging on the stock market, it's important to remember the Treasury has the authority and the flexibility to cut duration supply. And yeah. while uh, members of the Trump administration uh, or members of, say, Trump affiliates have been quite negative about the efforts that Janet Yellen did to constrain duration supply um, over the course of the last couple of years, you know, once you're sitting in office and you see those rates rise and it's starting to hit the stock market, uh, you know, that that uh, that moral outrage that we're seeing as the, uh, expressed <laughs> as they sit on the outside may become, you know, uh, a policy norm, uh, particularly. I mean, like, look, it's a politicized seat mm -hmm. in a highly political administration. And so my guess is if interest rates rise. They'll just cut the duration supply. And then the only real constraint is whether the dollar, you know, starts to fall. Um, and, you know, that in the context of, you know, the, the U.S. being uh, the outperformer, it's just, it's just probably not a big risk um, in certainly in the medium term, maybe eventually to be a risk, but not in the medium term. Yeah, I think that's a good answer. That's sort of what I meant by asking, like, do you worry about it? Because, you know, the hypothetical worry is, okay, do deficits keep blowing up to the point that, you know, buyers stop showing up for long-term debt and we see something like a failed auction. Obviously there's mechanics behind that, that, you know, pretty easily solve those, but that's like the doom scenarios. Like what if we get a, a failed auction at the treasury, you know, but obviously there's a lot of, there's a lot of tools behind that. Um, and and, and we, sh we should also remember that if we had a circumstance where the yield curve steepened in a way that was inconsistent with underlying macroeconomic conditions, Mm -hmm. you know, the Fed has the ability to buy an unlimited number of treasuries, right? And so you could have, uh, you know, the, the if if foreign buying wasn't enough to yeah. fund higher deficits and uh, and higher domestic buying as yields rise wasn't enough and the treasury cutting its duration supply wasn't enough, you know, it, it, when the chips are down, you can buy, the Fed can just buy the debt as a monetary policy tool and they can essentially buy an unlimited amount of debt, again, only constrained by the currency. Uh, and even then, there's a question about how constrained they are. I mean, just look at Japan. They've basically bought all of, you know, they've bought 50% of the outstanding government debt market, you know, that is multiples of GDP. 
And like, what's the problem? Like, yeah, the yen's down, you know, which is a good, you know, nice, nice for macro trading. But like, is someone standing in Tokyo really like feeling a terrible outcome as a function of that? Yeah, yeah. It feels like it's sort of just the maybe the the political will is it is, you know, like you're talking about basically QE, which has become a dirty word at this juncture. But you know, I think a bit about, you know, what the Bank of England did with the guilt crisis, where they came in with like a localized facility that they that was somewhat temporary and sort of orthogonal to the monetary policy, like they're about to start QT. The, the week after was was their current intentions and they actually did but you know they had this temporary program and then they unwound it later on so do you feel like that's something that the fed would be you know okay with doing say i don't know at some random time where even though they're hawkish from a policy perspective they come in with a localized facility like that yeah they, they certainly they certainly could provide targeted liquidity if there was a specific uh a specific concern you know i i kind of Look at that. Those are just all different flavors of QE. It depends on exactly the mechanics and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, the short story is it's just an example. Uh, the guilt crisis, so to speak, is just a good example of the fact that when there's a, a material acute problem, the central bank has unlimited ability to constrain the rise in bond yields. And so this idea that we're going to go to 15% bond yields you know, let's say when the economy, you know, when nominal growth is 5%, like it's not going to happen because the Fed's just not going to let that happen. Um, My last question on just the fiscal situation and potential electoral outcomes um, from this juncture is obviously there's a lot of talk about trying to decrease government spending, decrease deficits, um, you know, basically increasing efficiencies, bringing in, you know, Elon Musk to just, you know, cut the bloat, basically. When I look at the actual, you know, government spending, it's so much of it is like defense, social security, interest payments. Like, do you see any of that, like, efficiency that, you know, they're talking about cutting like $2 trillion. Do you see that as like even possible? I mean, could they cut $2 trillion? Like just for, in terms of orders of magnitude, discretionary spending is 1.7 trillion and half of that is military spending. So like, could they cut $2 trillion? Like, no, like not, not, (laughs) you know, that's a, um, I, I, I put that in the totally implausible camp. You know, you could see a, a circumstance where there's efforts made to increase efficiency in you know the existing bureaucracy, you know, I'm certain that there's plenty of plenty of things that could be done to increase the efficiency there. But like the impact, the macro impact of those things is like you know orders of magnitude less than the campaign rhetoric. It sounds great. Uh, we're going to cut two trillion dollars out of the deficit, you know. And it's like, okay, so when are you stopping the social security checks? And the answer mm-hmm. is like, uh, it's not going to happen. So you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's just the reality. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Um, okay, so within the context of everything you talked about, I want to get into asset allocation based on those perspectives. Um, you know, maybe starting with just equities, bonds, and gold would list love your high level of perspectives on your outlook on those three asset classes, how they interchange with it and other within a, a broad based modern portfolio, and just yeah, your broad outlook there. Yeah, well, I mean, I think basically what we've seen, the, the question outstanding 10, 15 days ago was um, uh, from a pol- from a fiscal policy perspective and a monetary policy perspective, were we going to have uh, an affirmation of over easy monetary and fo- fiscal policy or we were going to have some indication that that was likely to be dialed back, you know, given the electoral realities and maybe Chairman Powell uh, expressing some hesitation uh, about, the existing path of expected. And the answer is we basically just gotten total affirmation on both accounts, which is we're going to run over easy fiscal policy ahead and we're going to run over easy monetary policy ahead. And those sorts of circumstances, you know, while it's kind of unusual, it's not unheard of. And it, it's, you know, it's pretty straightforward how this works, which is uh, stocks and gold typically will do well in that sort of environment and bonds will not do well in that sort of environment on a relative basis. And one of the benefits of holding stocks and gold is you don't actually know whether the overly easy policy will um, will run essentially to non-productive hard assets or whether it'll stimulate nominal growth. You, you're not really sure. Uh, it, it's hard to know. And so uh, holding that package of stocks and gold together is uh, often a better package to be holding in these environments than just holding, for instance, stocks alone or or gold alone. 
when when you talk about bonds um being you know just to put it lightly a bit of a mess these days it feels like you know mostly that's the duration side but there's obviously the credit side is there any space for i don't know, like just like corporate credit either like high yield investment grade there because you know when i look at credit spreads there obviously they're like just incredibly tight um is there anything is there any spot for that on that side um you know if you can just like uh, duration hedge it or something like that yeah i mean credit spreads you know we have a circumstance where uh, continuing to run over easy monetary policy is supportive to, you know, keeping the rate of defaults low. Um, and, but at the same time, you're not getting compensated much for them. Yeah. And so, um, you know, what, what I see is that mostly what's happening is that credit spread investors are, uh, leveraging up a lot in order to basically make up for the fact that spreads are low. And that's, that's like a fine trade as long as there's no issue with the financial system and the economy. And, and I'm not seeing a lot of indications that that's likely to happen, but, um, but that's a dangerous place to be. Take it from someone who lived through, you know, 2006, seven and eight, like levering up to the gills on credit spread risk at secular tights, you know, it may not screw you today. It may not screw you tomorrow, but, there will be a day when things reverse and you're, you're probably going to be uh, caught without pants on uh, when the, uh, when the water goes out. Yeah. When the tide sounds goes like, out. sounds like you could have the same warning for anybody that's levering up on a FX carry trade right now too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. FX carry trades, uh, you know, offer the same risks, let's say uh, of, and, and obviously many people uh, learn some of the, challenges of that in August um, and, you know, are licking their wounds as a result. Um, obviously, we've had a pretty domestic perspective on most of this conversation in terms of the U.S., but is there anything that you're seeing in terms of emerging markets, some um, opportunities there, or thoughts there um, from a broad base there? Well, remember, the U.S. is, in fact, the best economy in the world. And so we should just talk about the U.S. because it's the most important. <laughs> well, no, I mean, well, point to a Canadian. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. And uh, as a member of the 51st True. state, uh, I hope you appreciate how important. The oh, US I do. I, I do not pay attention to the Canadian economy that much at all. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I uh, alternatively, having grown up in Detroit and been uh, and and only as a kid allowed to watch uh, PBS and CBC. I have a, a an unusual familiarity with the Canadian economy and experience. That's so funny. there you go. That uh, that I still enjoy. But um, I, I think if you just take a back, take a step back around the world, I think we're basically seeing the same sorts of overly easy policy dynamics pretty much everywhere. Like today is a good example. Actually, the Bank of England comes out and says we're going to push off the time frame for which we think, you know, till we think inflation is going to meet our mandate, but don't worry, we're cutting, right? It's like the same thing, right? You know, they easily could have been in a circumstance where they saw that set of conditions and said, let's just slow this down and not ease, but they continue to ease despite the inflation problem uh, persisting. And, and then really, if you look elsewhere, I mean, everyone's cutting and everyone's cutting pretty aggressively. Like China, you know, is doing basically whatever it takes on the monetary side to support their economy. They still have a lot of, a lot of effort on the fiscal side um, uh, that's needed in order to actually uh, deal with the uh, deleveraging that they're happening, that's happening, but they're easing the bank of Japan. You know, there's all this speculation. They were going to tighten aggressively. I mean, where, you know, I'm going to be dead by the time, the Bank of Japan tightens aggressively. Right? I've, been, I've <laughs> yeah. been doing this for all uh, more than twenty years, and uh, and still no aggressive tightening from the Bank of Japan, um, and no reason for them to. Canada's, you know, uh, easing aggressively, probably more appropriate um, given their underlying domestic economic circumstances, but still easing aggressively. The ECB is easing aggressively, despite the fact that, you know, unemployment rate is at multi-decade lows and services inflation is elevated and wage inflation is elevated. So they're delivering an easing and you add it all up. And it's actually pretty, pretty amazing. Like the amount, the number of central banks that are cutting interest rates today uh, mm -hmm. and the amount of cuts that are happening today uh, the last time this happened, other than the very acute March of 2020 period, was the middle of the financial crisis, October 2008. And like having lived through the financial crisis in 2008, I can tell you that like it ain't close. 
<laughs> like we are nowhere yeah. near what it felt like in 2008. And yet yeah. the ease, the level of aggression in terms of easing is roughly the same. And so you look at that and you say, it, does that make sense? No, that's a global over easy approach that we're seeing pretty much everywhere. Yeah. Well said. Um, Bob, last question here. You always have some hot takes that you put on Twitter and I always appreciate them. I just want to ask you for, for what is your, what is your final hot take or sage advice for those that, uh, trade or look at macro, um, as it stands today? Uh, I mean, I'd say, uh, fuck valuations. <laughs> so don't get caught up in PEs or what? Look, like I, Trust me, I I grew up in you know dividend discount models, cash flows, um, you know PEs mattering, valuation, um, uh, you know careful study of the of the internet bubble and how unreasonable it was, and nonetheless, when you have a set of monetary and fiscal momentum pushing the markets in a certain direction, like you can't you can't get sanctimonious about valuations in that sort of environment. Um, if you look back through time, and I've spent more time studying more bubbles than I'd recommend anyone do in their entire life, bubbles persist until there is a meaningful tightening of financial conditions, typically by the central bank. And um, you might think that U.S. stocks are in a bubble. You might think AI is a bubble. You might think PEs are too elevated, all of that. Um, and it doesn't really matter because as long as easy money persists, the bubble or the elevated valuations will persist. Someday that'll change, but um, uh, but not not in the not in the near term. And so, um, mm -hmm. if I see another chart of showing that stocks are overvalued, <laughs> like you know. Just just delete that. It's actually yeah. harming you to look at that chart. Oh, man, you're, you're preaching to the choir. Somebody that that attempted badly to be a value investor a long time ago, then <laughs> saw the light and decided to never fight the Fed again. You're yeah, you're preaching to the choir. <laughs> that's, that's, you know, you gotta, you gotta learn, right? Learn through pain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, Bob, that was a ton of fun. Really enjoyed that. It's great to have you on. Uh, where can folks go if they want to hear more about you? Yeah, for sure. If you, um, want more of my regular flow of hot takes, usually with slightly less profanity, uh, check out uh, my Twitter feed at Bobby Unlimited. I also have a YouTube where I have a variety of clips that I, uh, from my, uh, my various media appearances, that's at Bobby Unlimited. Um, and new, uh, just this, uh, just in the last few weeks, I've started a TikTok channel where I do uh, morning rundowns of what I'm seeing in the markets. No dancing yet, but, <laughs> It'll get there. Uh, and that is also at Bobby Unlimited. Uh, so uh, if you're into TikTok or have a Gen Z friend, family member, colleague, uh, you can go ahead and recommend that. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. Thanks so much.